things were divided into what we call BEV units. Yes. In that, he used distilled water as the basic water to measure all waters by. And it's simply a standard that says, if I have a particular BEV number of units, and that water is pure, that water is clean, it is drinkable. Reverse osmosis here, which I, we have on the screen, to give you an example of things that are looked at, pH and resistance are RH factor. And again, as it is gauged against distilled water, Reverse osmosis is a good way of purifying your water. The only problem we have with reverse osmosis is that it takes everything out of the water. And what's left after reverse osmosis is what we call in the water industry dead water. It does nothing, it gives nothing back to the body. So that we've got a water that's clean, but it's just sort of sitting there. It will not interact with your cells. As you can see, and this is in BEV units with reverse osmosis, the pH usually will range anywhere from 5.3 to 6.8. The RH factor is 25 to 29. We'll come back to the electrolysis portion of this, but electrolysis being a process that is used to clean up water, you can see the difference here in terms of the RH factor and the pH. It's almost 3,000-fold stronger than with a reverse osmosis unit. Now, I bring up reverse osmosis because the government is recommending to you that you use RO water, RO standing for reverse osmosis, or boil your water. Now here's the problem with boiling. When you boil your water, all you're doing, well, you will hit organisms that die at high temperatures. And I put it that way because with some of the mutations and some of the bacteria, viruses, and fungi, they're developing skins that are so hard that boiling the water doesn't even touch them. So that's one thing. Number two, like we talked about the trihalomethanes, gases like that get concentrated when you boil them. So in fact, as well as some of those heavy metals. So all you're doing is concentrating them and they're all in the bottom of your, <laughs> bottom of your pot or whatever it is that you boiled with. So that doesn't work. But that's what the government to date has recommended to folks to do. Boil your water. No good. Okay. As we move from that into the next spectrum of things and we start going into what other things do we need to look at in the water, let's take a look at pH, which was one of those items on that list in terms of looking at purity. Now here in this area, and I have this beautiful chart behind me because many of you have probably seen it and not paid too much attention to it. This is a chart that reflects the aquifer here in this region. Now, what is an aquifer? That's a particular bowl, we'll use that term, that all the groundwater seeps into. So this particular aquifer is a very large one. And the bowl is very large. And all of your water comes from that aquifer. Now, this is a very peculiar aquifer in that it's the type of aquifer that whatever's on the surface gets into the groundwater or gets into that bowl. So whether I'm over in Tumwater or I'm here in Yelm, anything on the surface, so somebody pours oil down a drain here or in Lacey, it's going to get into that bowl and be a factor that we draw our water from. Now all the pink areas up there are areas that are in trouble. This aquifer is in trouble as it relates to acidity, as it relates to what's on the surface getting into the bottom. This is from the state. This chart was given out by the state officials. When I started asking questions about, I said to them, I'm probably the only one in this entire region that tests their water two or three times a day. Um, why is our water having a pH below 7.0? And 7.0 is where it's a neutral point. It's where you want to have your drinking water to at least be at 7.0. And in testing, we were getting anywhere from 6.3 to 7.3. And I wanted to know, why is our water so acid there? They couldn't answer me. They still don't know. 
but it's a problem. If I look at pH on another perspective, how much acid is in the water, and I go to Long Island, New York, I find just the opposite. There we have pHs at 8.5, 8.0. And I said, wow, okay, so is this going to be great water here? What's going on? You know, it's very interesting to me. I just call them coinky dinks. But I just happened to be in the right places at the right time. And the Sunday while I was there, the newspaper in New York just happened to run an article on the groundwater on Long Island. And the Brookshaven Institute is located and has been based there for over 45 years in Long Island. And the problem is they had been dumping some of their chemicals into the ground. And the groundwater was contaminated. Contaminated so badly that the government had, of course, taken measures by putting lime into the water to try to get the pH up. And so the pH standardly was 8.5. But I knew from some of the patients that I had there that, as an example, we had kids with cleft palates in one square block. I'm sorry, correct on that. In one hospital, within a one-year period, 11 children were born with cleft palate. Now, the, the chances of that happening by accident are like one in a million are the normal numbers for that. 11 children in one hospital, all coming from the same geographical area had cleft palate. Goes even further. In one block, within one year, 11 women had breast cancer. All, again, on Long Island. I say, there's something wrong here. Just your good old common sense tells you there's something common here that's factoring in. I'll let you draw your own conclusions. But you can see that being too acidic and being too alkaline can have its problems. So you don't necessarily want to do that. In Arizona and New Mexico right now, they have the problem of too much alkalinity. In fact, their water starting at 7.8 and going up. And people are having problems from too much alkalinity in their water. So this is a vast country here. Waters will vary in different regions. And we need to be, that needs to be kept in mind. Now, I put up here this equation called the equation of life. Because this is an equation that was rediscovered by Dr. Kerry Reams shortly after the turn of the century. Now, equation of life, because this holds for humans, it holds for plants, and it holds for animals. This is a basic equation of life. If the soil is too acid, if the soil is too alkaline, disease will enter that, the plants grown in that soil, or they will be weak. If things are balanced, you'll get a tremendous yield, and again, the plants will be strong. The same thing happens with animals, their pH. As long as they fall along this equation, they will be free of disease. And you'll note there that we are looking at the pH of the urine and the pH of the saliva, which is reflective of the buildup in the body, how we how we break down our food stuff and stuffs and how we take these food stuffs and try to make them incorporate incorporate them into our bodies. So pH ideally should be 6.4 in both of those elements in order for the body to be diseased. Now it doesn't rely totally on pH because if you look at glucose here it's also how the body handles carbohydrates, how it handles mineral salts, and also when I look at nitrates and ammonia how we break down flesh protein, which would be meat, seafood, and poultry, and on the, I mean, on the nitrate side, and as we look at ammonia, how we handle vegetable protein. Next slide, please. Now, as we look at this and showing you the significance of, of that, we find that in this narrow pH of 6.4, we absorb all the minerals. And as we move away from that pH of 6.4, we find that there are certain minerals we can't absorb. So as an example, if we look at the next slide, but note before we change that, it's a little bit difficult to see from a different distance, that we're at both ends of the spectrum here. 